Hi, I'm Jimmy, and I approve this epic podcast. Okay. That was pretty good. Yeah, that was better than the last time. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> dude, it's still gonna happen. There's gonna be so many times we're gonna laugh, dude. It's My hands great. hurt. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the second ever episode of the Swift Podcast. This is definitely not our second take. Um, we're very happy to have the podcast up and running, and hopefully, we can be more consistent. <laughs> with our postings over the summer but yeah i'm here i'm here joined by luis who will be helping me co-host and um with these wonderful seniors who um do you guys want to introduce yourselves i'm lawrence i am the super cute technical assistant on swift's eboard and i will be graduating along with luis and alex hi i'm i'm alex i was a vp of ops for swift and i was cptc captain and i'm also graduating tomorrow oh nice what about you Luis oh I am Luis I am a, I was a technical assistant <laughs> my first semester and then I transitioned into a director of labs for the second semester good times and also graduating with these people dang why are you guys graduating <laughs> I don't know I said the why same why aren't thing. you graduating <laughs> I've only been here for two semesters <laughs> for 20 years sounds like a you problem tragic excuses <laughs> Dude, that sip that was like it was actual like I I, I like energy. someone did mention I drink water really fancy because I left my pinky up. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right. You know, just like one of the consequences of being in higher society. <laughs> oh, no. oh no. Well, that's a wrap, folks. That was our second podcast. Oh. We'll leave it at that. We might get canceled. That was too good. Well, yeah. I'm very happy. All right. I don't know if I'm happy. If you guys are good. I have mixed feelings. It's definitely bittersweet. Yeah. You gonna miss us? <laughs> He's already crying. Nah. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah. I'm, dry. I'm ready to get out of here, dude. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's like a little bit of a bittersweet thing. It's like, you know, we're, uh, well, at least for me, I'm like, we're, we're, we're leaving things. Um, we made a lot of good friends over, over the course of the, like, even that's just true. one year and stuff, so... Um, at least for me, it's like a little bit of a bittersweet moment, but i um, kind of curious on that end. Is it like, what do you guys feel kind of leaving, so to speak? It's like, um, I didn't make any friends until my senior year. And it's like, wow, I finally met so many cool people and now I have to say bye to them. It's like, I'm definitely really sad and like pissed that COVID happened because like that ruined a lot of the opportunities that I had to actually meet all the cute people in Swift earlier. And I'm really really bitter about it but life goes on <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's not like we're going to you know never ever meet again which is like really good because we're i know for defcon. yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. defcon so in the like, summer. It, it just shows that like the legacy is something that persists and it's not something that's just once and done mm-hmm. but how do you feel alex i feel great <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, <bro. laughs> i'm out of here i'm definitely not gonna miss the exams and the homework i'm gonna miss the awesome people of swift though obviously we only have one semester of fully in person but even that was like half in person you know they kind of got us with the bait and switch but mm, i feel like i've taken advantage of everything that i could have taken advantage of in terms of opportunities and i'm graduating on a very high note because we won in January in our competition. We are now also in like a new golden age of Swift, where the new eboard are very talented and very numerous. And we're at a high point of Swift attendance and projects and everything. So it's only gonna go uphill from now. And I think if, if any, if there's ever a good moment to graduate on, I think that's a really good one. Yeah. yeah. What is that competition you won? <clears throat> So this competition, <laughs> you might have heard, it's called uh, the Collegiate Penetration Testing Competition. Mm-hmm. And this competition is about ethical hacking with a team of consultants. So we're in a team of six like consultants. We're hired by a fictitious business. We then do some open source research on that business. We then come in on competition day and compromise their systems looking for vulnerabilities. And then we present all our findings in a big report for the executives. 
and then we also present it. And in fact, we beat all the little community college schools like Stanford and the Carnegie Mellon and Rochester <laughs> Institute of Technology. And like, I think overall 100 schools or more participated. You know, we made it past the regional stage. We took gold and then we took gold at the international stage. You know, n not that I'm bragging or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like keeping it on the down what kind of thing. How can one get involved with these, with this competition if they're coming to Cal Poly Pomona? I heard there's a boot camp starting on July 2nd. Yeah. Is that right, Lawrence? Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that? Um, yeah, the boot camps are going to be for both what Alex mentioned, the penetration testing competition, but also for CCDC, which if you don't know, it's the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. And I was on the Windows team, actually, uh, this year. And what we're going to be doing during the boot camps is we're going to be teaching everyone, no matter your skill level, the, from the basics on how you can actually succeed in these competitions, basically bring the knowledge that we got from these competitions and giving it back to the community. And it's going to culminate with a trial where you can actually try to see if you can make it into one of the positions on either the CPTC team or the CCDC team. And I highly recommend everyone to do it, even if you're not able to participate in the competitions for whatever reason, because I learned so much for the trials, and I fully believe like that is like what actually got me started in my cybersecurity journey. And I'm sure like Luis has some things to say about it too. Yeah, yeah, but um, it, it's interesting because uh, we both and I, I met Lawrence like <laughs> during those summer trainings, and I, I think that was like one of the biggest um, eye openers for me was actually participating in those trainings over the summer. And I personally did not compete or make it onto any of the two teams that were aforementioned. Um, and I think the biggest thing for that really was just the fact that, regardless of my position, you know, not actually making it onto the teams, I still gained a significant amount of knowledge that transferred over for every single one of the things that we were like working on for projects, both internally in Swift moving forward, and just in general in like my own career stuff. like. 80% um, of the questions that I ended up getting from like my interviews were all just <laughs> based on like what I was doing for the trainings and stuff like that. Uh, everything afterwards was more like, oh, you know what, you're involved in this club. And that was like such a minimal part of it, but most of it came from like the technical knowledge and just like the interactions of what I had to go through through that training. So there's a lot to pull from and there's a significant amount of value for that. So um, irregardless of whether or not you think you're qualified, just like Lawrence is saying, or whether or not you even, you know, just get over the imposter syndrome and just like, just do it. It's, it gives so many uh, benefits back over to you and there's so many things to pull from that. Um, honestly, like irregardless if you make it onto the team or not, you're gonna do great. Yeah. Wow, I feel like I, 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 I practiced that pitch so many times because we have to do that. <laughs> it's just muscle memory at this point. Yeah, because I'm like, well, we talked to a lot of the different, well, I mean, our episode today is mostly about like legacy, right? Yeah. So one of the biggest things is like, has been talking to so many different students like over the course of our <laughs> our time here like at Swift right so um, for me that's like something that has it holds a special place in my heart is that like going over and then helping somebody on like their trajectory and like how what they're going to be doing moving forward and stuff so <laughs> well it, it's it's funny that I'm like oh yeah you know I, I memorize that thing but it, it's also like a valid or you know it's a big thing for me because um I want to make sure that when I uh, come across somebody that's like you know I'm not feeling too good. I don't feel like cybersecurity is for me. Like I want to make them feel like, dude, who cares? Because I, I didn't do, I didn't do any yeah. anything until we just got recently, like in senior year and stuff. So I want to make sure that, like, you know, we can help as many peeps out uh, wherever it is that they're in their stage of their college career and stuff. So speaking on that too, um, I'm curious, like, what were your journeys getting into the um, getting into the both respective competitions and stuff? Like, how did you guys start? What did you learn? And kind of like, how is it um, kind of coming after that? after the dust has settled, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, like Luis mentioned, I started really, really late because my first three years of college, I was just really lazy. I just like went to the library and watched The Office in my downtime. <laughs> <laughs> no Not once, but seven times. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, and that's just like to show exactly um, how little I did, you know? And that's just like something that really depressed me as I was entering senior year. It's like, wow, I just wasted all my time. Why didn't I even come to college? And then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to grind out this year. So like the summer before my senior year, I actually got my Security Plus certification. And it's, um, it's not exactly that prestigious of a cert, it's more entry level. But even then, that gave me like the confidence that I could actually do some basic cyber stuff and to, you know, convince myself that I'm not 
you know, as bad as I thought it would, was, and that I could actually participate in all the cyber things. And that's why I actually did the tryouts, and I <laughs> didn't do too well, actually. Uh, I got absolutely dumpstered during the CCDC trial, and <laughs> I know a lot of people did too. And I actually thought about switching majors after it because, like, <laughs> <laughs> that traumatized. Me. Yeah, traumatized. I was. Yeah, I was definitely traumatized. And um, but I ended up making the team, which really surprised me because, like, I volunteered for black team for WRCCDC because I was absolutely convinced I wouldn't make it, and I still wanted to, you know, gain some. Uh, experience with like the competition in general but then Taylor messages me and he's like hey you actually made the team so I had to have like the awkward talk with Sub Wasabi and <laughs> oh, no. about like you know hey can I stop volunteering and you know actually join the competition which they let me because I never joined any of the volunteering meetings yet at that you, point were you so. actually able to hear Wasabi's voice did you get the luxury of that no only <laughs> only discord messages but I did hear him during the phone calls on CCDC wow. You know. wow but it's like after after CCDC I just like I had a lot of fun and I didn't expect that at all getting into cyber mm -hmm. and like it, it, it just changed my life because now I'm actually going into a career delegated to cyber when like a year before this, I had no idea what I was going to do. So that's like kind of my journey. And what's yours, Alex? Because yours is really good. My lore is kind of wild. <laughs> my lore? <laughs> yeah. The Alex lore is that I came over here when I was 16. I got out of high school early, started community college. And as one would expect in community college, there's really not much cyber going on. In fact, I'm pretty sure I was the only person who was saying and, and wanting to do cyber as a career so that was it was kind of disheartening to just be alone like that but i didn't really let it stop me and i didn't immediately start in cyber i started off like a, an adjacent um i think i started on in game development and then i moved into communications and then back to cyber because you know you don't really get a job in communications and you don't really get paid <laughs> so when i started in cyber my start a lot like Lawrence's is security plus so I got my security plus cert and it was a lot of prep work but it also gave me a lot of confidence when I passed it it was really helpful on getting me started and in fact the day after I passed my security plus that's when I created my blog no security dot blog check it out Check it out. <laughs> yeah. And so I in. decided that it's going to be good content if I post something. First of all, I have a, a personal brand that I can share and show as my portfolio. And I just posted this article about how I passed Security Plus, what kind of prep I did, what kind of study, study materials I went over. And people online, specifically on Reddit, found it really helpful on some of those cyber communities that are out there. I did too. You did too. <laughs> yeah. so, so it was my, my start, and I, I believe even in that article, when I passed it, I pledged that next year I'm going to come back for a CISA Plus, which is a Cybersecurity Analyst Plus certification from CompTIA. And almost exactly a year after, I did sit down for CISA Plus, and I passed it too. And I was still community college. So I didn't really have anything in terms of technical, practical knowledge, hands-on. But what I did have is I knew all the definitions from all these certs. And so when I came into Cal Poly, I did know vaguely what people were talking about in the boot camp and Swift. But I didn't really know how to do any of it. Like I knew what a firewall is and how it works and that it works on default deny and I, I knew a lot of different things but then when ccdc bootcamp gave me the homework of okay set up a web server i was absolutely stumped because these certs don't really prepare you for practical hands-on stuff and despite that i did try out for both ccdc and cptc and somehow i got on both teams and by the way i got absolutely trashed on ccdc as well <laughs> and in cptc i did even worse because I had virtually no penetration testing or ethical hacking knowledge at the time or experience. And so my tryout experience was just, there's four machines that you need to crack to fully compromise the environment. I didn't even crack one fully. So it was, it was something. But the team didn't have enough people on it, so I still got on. Damn. <laughs> and that was, that was basically my journey, right? I started on, on both teams. I was going to do defense first 
as in I wanted to do security engineering or security analyst when I graduate. But then as I was going through my university and as I was going through my internships, and I've had two, I was just realizing that, you know, I'm having all this success with offensive security, so penetration testing. I had so much fun in my red team internship. I also performed really well in CPTC despite my lack of experience. And then on the defense side, you know, I didn't really do too well in CCDC, and I also didn't really like my internship in security engineering. So I just kind of, you know, I was going in thinking I'm going to be a security guy, but <laughs> I'm going to be creating incidents instead. <laughs> well, we're all under the umbrella, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like, it makes sense. Yeah. That's actually pretty cool. I'm going to be uh, giving you guys work. Uh. <laughs> Professional APT. Yeah, it's okay. Come get in my router. Please. You're making. You're gonna make me do paperwork, dude. I'm like the only guy who likes to do auditing. <laughs> oh, no. I'm like, no, dude. I'm sorry. Luis. Actually, tragic. It's cool. Um, well, I don't know if you have another. If you want to go first for for your question, or if you have one, because I do, but I'm just like, well, how would you recommend people that are sort of like, man, I don't think I'm qualified for this. So oh, trying. It's like obviously we've heard your stories, but. We've seen how far you've come. It's sort of wondering how you would make that mentality to actually go and put yourself out there and try out. That's like something I really resonate with because a lot of the things I've done um, were because like I just breached that thought, that mentality of I'm not qualified enough. Because like even though you think you are, it's important to understand that everyone else feels the same way. Like. Jacob, Luis, Alex, even though they all seem like really <laughs> high level compared to beginners, you don't understand. Like even Jacob one time, he was talking to us about like imposter syndrome. <laughs> 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 How he feels like he's not qualified for um, SoCal Edison and stuff. And it's like, I remember saying, Jacob, I should be the one who's feeling like that. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's just the common mentality that everyone has. Because cyber is just like a really expansive field in general. There's no way you're going to be able to learn it all. But you shouldn't let that fact stop you. And this is like just something really important that's kind of hard to instill. Because it, it's really hard to breach that mentality. But like speaking from my experience, after taking the security plus... I don't think I was extremely qualified at all. And that's what made me realize I could have participated in Swift workshops. I could have done the tryouts even without having that knowledge because the bar is honestly extremely low. You don't need to be ingenious to do anything cyber related. All you need to do is like actually put in the time, put in the effort and put in your due diligence and learning the material because that's how everyone starts. And that's how everyone becomes, you know, really smart. I also, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Like you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, I thought you blew him a kiss, dude. It was so low. I was like, I can. Hold <laughs> up. Off camera. Off camera, off camera. I, I mean, I did it on camera, but you know what? Off camera, too. It's fine. I'll block it right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll censor Look it. away. <laughs> Look away. Put the, put the black bar over my mouth, dude. Yeah. Put, put your black box on Alex and <laughs> It's so good. Um, you know, talking a little bit more on that, too. Um, I think there's also this uh, this strange aura of like how intimidating just like cybersecurity is. I, f I feel like there's just this mentality that, oh, you know, you're gonna work on computers, so there's this like giant huge wall that you have to surpass or like break through to be successful in it. And I don't think you really do. It's, it's just a matter of like asking questions. Like I, I talked to Alex about this beforehand too and stuff and just kind of like, hey, you know, how is it that you got into this kind of stuff? And for me, like, it was honestly just asking questions. Like that was the biggest thing was just going out of, out of my way to like make the effort to say, you know what, I need to learn something. And if even if I look stupid doing it, like screw it. Like I need to go and do this because you're never gonna learn just by doing things like, I mean, you, you can get so far just by yourself, but you're never really gonna truly surpass like getting into the bigger roles or like getting into a, or getting exposed to like different knowledge without asking people or without, you know, getting other people's like perspectives on things like working together, like at a company, like even just, you know, <laughs> seeing how things move from there, like uh, talking to so many different professionals, like that's one of the biggest things that they always emphasize is like, you're going to work with other people. That's the most important part. Technical knowledge, it can always be learned, but like, you know, get social skills and being able to like understand things from different people's perspectives and getting, you know, getting different knowledge is like the biggest thing that you that you can't really replace. That's something that you can't really like 
you know, <laughs> uh, you can learn that, but it's like it, the biggest thing is like being able to overcome like your own fear. And that's like a, a really big, like huge part that at least for me, when I was getting into it, like I had to kind of like throw myself out there. Um, my experience is a little bit easier, I can say, just because I'm like, I don't know. When I look at cybersecurity, like from a complete outsider's perspective, because I'm like, my biggest thing was never this. It was mostly like music and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, but I, I go play at a backyard show. When people Mortalis. 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 Uh, but yeah, when I see some guys start throwing like beer bottles at each other and I'm like, <laughs> you know what? This piece of paper or that dude, they ain't going to hurt me. I'm like, so I'm like, I'm not scared to ask questions over here. Like that's the easier thing to do. So yeah, I'm like, for me, it was like a little bit easier in terms of like getting over that kind of like um, social barrier, so to speak. But I can understand how it might be harder for someone else, maybe who hasn't had that kind of like exposure and stuff. But honestly, just get over it ask questions even if you feel like you're gonna look dumb because if you don't know like the worst thing you can do is when you get to your job <laughs> and then you have to start asking questions when you're playing with people's money that's like the worst thing that can honestly happen so it's better to like mess up now when you're like in a kind of more safer environment to kind of like make these mistakes or whatever so yeah that's what i'm like i think that's a big part um of like getting into cybersecurity and stuff like how did you feel about that i I actually have a good story to tell, a short one about people feeling like they're not good enough. And it's a story of how, you know, like we're in these silos where we think about ourselves and we think, oh, I'm not qualified to do this competition or not qualified to apply to this job and things like that. Well, everyone else feels the same way, almost everyone else. And I have the story of everyone else being that way. And then <laughs> what that means, it still makes me angry a year after. It's been two years now, actually. So what happened was my first year when I was trying for CPTC, I mentioned that I did absolutely terrible. Out of four machines, I didn't even pwn one fully. Well, there were 10 people trying out. And there were people who did all four machines at the time. And they didn't submit their report. They did not submit their report. And I submitted a report that barely had anything on it. And I got on the team because they did not put their report in. But why didn't they put their report in? It's because they had the same exact imposter syndrome thoughts and mentality of I'm not good enough yet. I'm not prepared yet. And all these other people trying out are so much better. And I had exactly the same thing, except for me, it was justified, not for other people trying out who actually did the work. But, you know, the captain at the time, Joe, he messaged me and said, you know, turn in whatever you have. And I did. And so that was enough for me to get on the team. But that's the, the moral of the story, really. If you think that way, everyone else also thinks that way. And... The reality is that most of us are wrong when we think that because like Lawrence said, you don't really need to be a genius. You just need to put in the work, put in the, the time to really learn all these things. And the boot camps are really designed to take you from no knowledge to being at least somewhat competent and ready if you pay attention and do the homework. So whatever that might be, you know, even with competition teams, clubs, even more importantly with jobs and internships. I'd say just shoot your resume, right? Just yeah. send the applications in. However you might feel about your fitness for any position, just send it in because you're just like, th there's nothing that you lose if you apply. In fact, if you apply, even if you get to a point where you're interviewing and then you get shut down or thrown out the process or maybe you get rejected at the resume portion, Whatever that is, it's still a learning opportunity because now at least you know, okay, well, either my resume sucks or my interview skills suck or maybe I just need more stuff that I can you know, talk about. So whatever you do, just shoot that opportunity. And I, I have a similar story on that front, but what, what that was was basically I did not want to apply to what is now going to be my full-time job because I was convinced that I had virtually zero experience that they were requiring. So I was 100% certain that I'm not even going to get to an interview when I apply there. And Andy from the CPTC team was basically just giving me the pep talk of, don't be stupid, just send me a resume in. And I did. And I was shocked when I got an interview invitation. 
and then I was shocked when I advanced to the next level. And then I went to the final level and then they said, okay, we'll take you as an intern. And then that internship led to a full-time job. And if I was just to listen to my own thoughts and just continue being stupid, you know, as opposed to what Andy was telling me to do, then I would have never had this opportunity and good job out of college. So don't be dumb. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Just, just do, do it. it. Don't let your dreams be dreams. Dude, that's that's such a great story. Um, you, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm, I, I kind of want to like roll on that same line of thought. But like, how big does or how big of a part does like failure play in like um, in terms of trying to like learn things or like in terms of your journeys? Like, how how big how big of a part did like failing play in that? Like kind of overcoming it. Dude, I failed a bunch. <laughs> I'm like, I how many times? so much. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, and there's like so many examples I can think of um, in terms of just what I was doing in community college. When I first started in cybersecurity, like practically applying my skills, I started off with Capture the Flag events. And the first two that I did, no, the first one that I did, there was a, a web application challenge where you had to chain a few vulnerabilities to get a flag on the system. And I didn't even pwn it in time. Like I spent several days working on that challenge. I, not, I did not pwn it. And I had to get help from other people doing that challenge to even like finish it. But I still stuck around. I did a bunch more CTFs and I still failed. <laughs> I kept doing them I, and I just could not really succeed in that but every time that I was doing them and then meeting the write-up after the challenge um, was over I would get a little better and a little better every time and then I realized that throughout all these failures eventually I reached a point where I could solve my own challenges and you know I still failed a bunch more and I, I failed at CCDC tryout and CVTC tryout but like all this failure is really just learning opportunities in interviews too. Like I failed at a bunch of interviews and, and job applications. Like I even interviewed with Facebook. I don't know how they, hey, they came out to interview me <laughs> before you get, you know, surprised or like impressed by that. I failed miserably because they had a coding part and <laughs> I knew how to like code a little bit in Python, but the solution I came up with with was probably the dumbest that never you heard. <laughs> <laughs> and and still I don't feel bitter or embarrassed about it because ultimately those experiences of interviewing and failing and those CTFs that I failed at led to me eventually succeeding in CTFs and eventually succeeding in interviews. Hmm. What about you, Lawrence? Um I just see failure as like a sort of natural process because no one is able to do things perfectly the first time, right? So it's like what's the alternative? obviously you're going to fail a few times and that's like just something that i'm pretty sure every single person can resonate with because you're always going to fail at something like for me i i failed the ccdc trial in my mind because like i didn't do much i just like turned my computers on and off again i i didn't even like <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I configured the firewall for only a linux machine and i only did the password changes for like the Windows machines and it's like it's it, I had a lot of failures but um when it also came to like job applications and stuff I failed a whole bunch like I applied to Mandiant and Crouch Strike a whole other companies even government positions too but like I didn't get accepted for even an interview until I like I actually went to Lockheed Martin and then like they gave me the interview and it's like I didn't even think that I was going to be accepted for an interview at Lockheed. I just assumed it would be another failure, right? Because like I had this consistent chain of not even being considered for an interview, which would like really demoralize me. So at that point, I was just like, you know what? Screw it. I'll just try it out anyways. And so like it ended up working out. So it's important to make sure that you don't make the failures like rule over you. You have to supersede them, make them your, um, you know, you're lesser. <laughs> like you, you, <laughs> you're you, lesser. You, you need to own your failures, basically. Mm -hmm. Because, like, that is what kind of builds you into what you are today. And if you don't control and you let the failures control you, then you're just setting yourself up for failure in itself. 
That's actually pretty cool. Did, um, kind of going in, in that same line of thought in terms of like growth and learning, did you guys have like um, mentors in terms of, you know, that were able to kind of like teach you these kind of things? I know. I mean, in the total not uh, first take that we did, we did not totally not answer that question. I'm glad but... you asked. <laughs> I am so glad you asked because we have a huge mentorship culture at Swift. And I think that's what makes us the best club on campus. And especially in the CIS department or the CBA. No bias. No bias. No bias. No bias. No bias. No bias. Totally objective. No, but we are the biggest club and the best, so I'm, I'm not kidding about that. Anyway, the mentorship part is we have eboard members who are more senior than us when we join, right? So me and Lawrence, for example, we just kind of joined in, and the eboard members at the time, they were already outgoing. And in Swift, the reason why year from year we don't go from like you know the highest of highs to just being a trash club the next year is because we prepare and make sure to give the knowledge over to the next generation of eboard and just cyber people in general. You don't even need to be eboard. We just try to give back whatever we've learned to make sure that we can keep this going. Because this cycle, believe it or not, has been going on for like two decades, if not more now. I forget how many years Swift is, but it started off in the 90s and it just kept going on from there, right? people come in and learn from their more experienced peers and then they are the more experienced peers when their peers graduate and so it's their job now to teach and to give back that knowledge and opportunities and that's what me and Lawrence have spent this last year on and Luis especially too we've spent our last year doing that right building up the next generation giving them all the tools and knowledge necessary to keep this going and for me personally, I've had a lot of mentors and support from eBoard that are current and past, but I, I want to specifically call out Bryce Lauer, who's a very attractive man, but <laughs> also a very, um, how would I say, he has a huge heart, right? He just has spread the positivity and knowledge and, and teaching through so many generations now because he's graduated over a year ago, but he's been around to help me. He's been around to help Justin Covert the next CPTC captain and current as um, student operations center director. He's also helped Dylan Tran, who's OSCP certified, by the way. And he's just mentored so many more people than just us three. And so, you know, huge thank you to Bryce and huge thank you to Swift because beyond just mentoring in terms of eboard and one another, right, like peer mentoring, there's also a program that we do usually where we connect current Swift students with alumni in the industry. And I was personally connected with Sean McAllister, who's been awesome. He was a security engineer at Uber at the time, and he helped me tremendously in terms of actually getting to the level where I could apply to Mandian and get an internship there. But as for me, I had two official mentors. They were Dennis Tran, and they are also Taylor Nguyen. And they really helped me out a lot. Dennis was like um, introducing me to Swift, you know, because first I only joined for the Costco combo pizza that they were <laughs> giving on the workshops. It, it's so sad that it's discontinued. But like I talked to Dennis for a bit and he actually invited me to over to Telco Lab. And that's when I decided to stay not just for the pizza, but for like the community and the meetings and workshops. And from there, I then got another mentor, Taylor, you know, once Dennis graduated, sadly. And Taylor is a man of very few words, but <laughs> <laughs> despite that, I feel like he had a lot of influence on me as well, because I remember I was only an admin assistant at the time, but then Taylor kind of pushed me to do more things as well, because I think he saw that like I wanted to get into the more technical things. So he's like, you should be a technical assistant for eBoard. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I applied and there's also another memory I have he asked me if I wanted to do an ITC competition um, and I remember at the time I didn't want to do it not because I didn't think I was capable but because I was just lazy so I just told Taylor I was really busy which wasn't true <laughs> but then like I felt really bad about it afterwards because I thought you know what like what really is stopping me and like that instant was when I had the epiphany of like, well, I actually am lazy to the point where it's actually self-destructive. So, you know, I should stop caring about like, you know, not wanting to do anything and actually just start doing stuff. So after that, 
I got my security plus over the summer. It's like that was the moment. But I do want to mention that like the great thing about Swift is like you have so many people who are absolute geniuses at their own specific fields that like it doesn't matter if people are younger than you, you could still like see them as their mentors as well. Like for CCDC, I learned a whole lot from Evan Dieters and Jessica Love. <laughs> yeah. Like those people taught me so much about Windows. I went from like knowing nothing to knowing a lot. Yeah. Because like they just taught me so much. They're really smart people. And like there's Robinson Tran too, who helped me out a lot. And yesterday I even got help from Derek because like I was trying to do time lapse on Hack the Box and he gave me a nudge. And so like you don't have to look to the people who are senior to you to be your mentors. There's really smart people like let's just say Jacob and Dylan, you know, just to throw out some names out there. But even people younger than you have so much expertise that you could share and it never hurts from like benefiting from a set of new eyes. So like mentors could be found both young, both old, right? <laughs> mentors are everywhere and that's what you should walk away with. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's such a crazy journey, just um, kind of like where I ended up first starting out and um, going from like <laughs> initially asking Alex like, hey, what is Solar Winds hack? And then him giving me an entire breakdown to like, um, then going into Robinson, um, like actually giving me an entire three hour peck talk on, hey, you should do CCDC. And then going over to Dennis Tran and him giving like an entire thing on my resume. So it just echoing the same words that like Lawrence like beautifully said right now is that like you can learn from so many different people. And just the fact that like, you know, mentorship isn't just, um, you know, consolidated into one small bubble. It's like you can learn from so many different people and so many people can be your mentor. And I think that was one of the biggest proponents like for me um, being in the club was that every single person that I came across, like I always try to learn something new from what it is that they were trying to like get through or trying to understand from their perspective, like how they solve problems and stuff. Because that's, at least for me, like that's the biggest thing is that like, if I'm stuck with something that, you know, maybe so Alex ended up having to go through that same thing. I try to get into his mindset or Lawrence or Jacob or anybody. So I think it's like trying to tackle different problems from different perspectives and um, big shout out to Robinson and um, because I, <laughs> I have literally been promoting him <laughs> as the champion for so many different, you know, for seniors like ourselves and stuff. Um, and so many peeps that come over that are like, you know what, I'm on my last year. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm scared, man. Like, help me out. Like, what can I do? And I always um, give Robinson's story back over because he is like the champion of what it means to like come so far so quickly and just like for the seniors in general like where you feel like there's absolutely no option left for you he made his options he made he carved out his like own you know his own trophies his own achievements and stuff and that's the story i always give back over because like um yeah, he, if you don't know, um, pretty much Robinson ended up coming over and he's like, from the like the last semester, he's like, you know what, I need to join over this, this CPTC thing. Like, I need to get into this. And so he literally went from like zero to hero within like the course of like one, uh, was it like about a year or two, or two semesters or something like that? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. He, within the course of only one year, he grinded ev everything out, made it to... Uh, made it to the onto not only onto the team the cbtc team but he actually made it to be like a global champion so i'm like he's part of the the team that alex is in so it, it's just so awesome to like see that and just the fact that like now he owes oh, so many different opportunities ended up coming over him over to him because he actually decided to like take a risk and not graduate because he was supposed to graduate i believe that's um the spring prior but you know what he's like i'm gonna take an extra semester so he pushed his classes back to literally make it onto the tryouts and to make it onto the team and that risk like significantly paid off so he he made so many different achievements and i think like I, I always want to give that story back over to people because you know what it's never too late for things and um you know like there's so many new peeps that are coming in over and not only them but um there's a lot of different like people that are barely getting introduced to swift i didn't get introduced to swift until like my senior year so just the fact that seeing like how he ended up taking these different risks and like having you know and the work that he had to put in there to make them pay off that's something that I, I i can resonate significantly because like i ended up quitting my job just to do more projects for like swift and stuff so just the fact that like you know seeing you know how, how different people tackle on problems is like can be such an inspiration for people and can like change the trajectory change the tra trajectory 
of like you know your life in general so um big shout out over to robinson because like for sure he's one of like <laughs> my biggest mentors and and um just like has helped me out significantly in, in the course of my journey and stuff. So it's super awesome to, to kind of see him like be happy now. And I'm like, ah, he's looking down and smiling. <laughs> I know, he's looking <laughs> down and smiling. <laughs> he was on the last podcast. If you wanna, if you haven't watched that one already. Yeah, yeah, very, very great words. So definitely check that out. It's super good. Um, I'm kind of curious too because I'm like, uh, we didn't get to touch on it beforehand, but like, what were some of your biggest memories from like the competitions? Like. I know oh, there was no, a there was there was <laughs> there was a hefty oh, amount no. of good memories, oh, no. but uh, I'm just kind of like curious. Like, um, what were some of, like the biggest stokes? Um, I I really like the environment of like working together during invitationals qualifiers. The last one, not so much because there were a lot of things that went down really bad, so like I couldn't do much. But like working in a team environment just like really opened my eyes to how fun it actually was. Because I did do debate in high school, but that's not so much as a team as it is with, like, one or two other people. Here, I was actually working with ten, eight other, like, really smart people all in one single room for, how long was it? Was it, like, six hours a day? Yeah, Whoa. it's a decent amount of time. Yo. And it, it's just really fun to see, like, Taylor manage everyone. <laughs> you know, we have, like, that one cohesive environment. Tira's like, hey, we have to inject, and we're like, okay, we need to, like, get onto it now. And I really like how well finely oiled the machine could be at times, but also when, like, the machine just breaks, because that's just really uh, uh, fun as well. Like, I remember one time um, during the actual WRCCDC regional competition, or, uh, yeah, what happened was, like, for some reason, one of our domain controllers just, like, couldn't be RDP'd into, which was like really weird. And then we noticed that that was the same case for every single other machine. So like the only way we could actually do our configurations was through SSH, and that's kind of a pain to do firewall configurations with. So like, I, I honestly, I gave up. I just wanted to do injects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then Jess at the time, she was like, she managed to fix the issue because like, and, and that just shows it's like you you could trust in your teammates that they could do things that you're not good at because like I, I'm pretty bad with troubleshooting that kind of group policy kind of issue. But Jess is a master at group policy, so she was able to do it. And it's like, wow, it's like we fill in the gaps that other people have, and that's what I really like about the um, competitions because it shows that you don't have to know everything. Other people could fill in your information. You just have to be able to work together with them. I remember Lawrence was when we were down bad. Taylor was like, "Yeah, we have next year." And Lawrence was like, "Oops, sorry, Lawrence." <laughs> oh, like, ain't no way. Actually, tragic. Yeah, that's good, dude. That's actually pretty cool. Like, how about for yourself, Alex? Like, what was some of the most memorable times over when you were working with the CPTC team? I know we even have the the famous Robinson Nixon. Yes, <laughs> it's so good. Yes, the. So, if you're in the Swift Discord, and if you're not, how did you even find this video? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> Who are you? I probably gave it to you. But if you are, if you look into stickers, you can see that there's a picture of a guy throwing his hands up, and that's actually <laughs> Robinson. And I would say that from this year, out of everything, like even out of just winning the international round, Robinson just throwing up his hands and celebrating I think was the the highlight of the year for me because Looking at that picture just means so much for me personally because like Luis was talking about Robinson's journey Because to me what that sticker is I, I forget what we called it but to me is just the man with the dream because Robinson had the dream of you know, Lord, Robinson, I hope you don't blame me for it, but I saw that you have a sticker on your laptop that says, you know, CrowdStrike or Mandian. And just in general, right, the man had a dream of, I want to graduate and start a good career in cybersecurity and be well paid, as everyone should. And he took that huge risk of not graduating on time just to have that chance of getting on the team. You know, as much as we're friends, I had no right to just get friends on the team. You know, it's an anonymous process where myself and a few alumni were looking at reports that are anonymized, so we didn't see the names. 
We just graded them on the merit of the report itself. So I had no input in whether or not Robinson was going to make it on the team. But he still did. And not only did he make it on the team, he did so well. I'm convinced that he was instrumental in us being first in the world because he put so much work. He was almost the only person working on GDPR, which is a privacy regulation of the European Union. He learned that thing and he found ways to make business value out of auditing for that during the competition. And that was instrumental in us winning. And as a result of that, he made it to Andrew, which is a, a startup that does really cool things and he's well paid. And most of all, he's working with Bryce Lauer. <laughs> <laughs> so Robinson, the man with the dream, I, I'd say that was the highlight because with that reaction of, you know, him celebrating, that was us getting a shell during the regional competition. And when I saw it, to me, it, it meant so much more because of all this backstory, you know, the Robinson lore and what that really meant for him when we got um, success, basically, at the regional round. So that was the, the highlight. And then from the year before, it was really fun at CPTC because we had this really cool role play scenario where we were attacking a utility company, utility slash um, water company. And what we did was... We neglected some safety rules, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> and we were just kind of down bad for vulnerabilities. So we started a vulnerability scan with something called uh, OpenVAS. OpenVAS is a open source vulnerability scanner. And we just kind of left it go and it's notoriously slow. It's so slow, we just kind of let it loose on the subnet with industrial control systems. What could go wrong? <laughs> and we forgot to turn it off. Well. You know, we got a reminder to turn it off when we got a call from the point of contact who was yelling and had sirens in the background, you know, saying, these systems have been up for a decade. What did you do? <laughs> and we were so confused because, you know, what could we have done? And then, oh, shit, we forgot OpenVAS <laughs> is still running. That thing was just scanning and taking systems down. And the competition organizers had monitoring on. And so they saw that the dam that we were supposed to be um, assessing for security issues was overflowing because we took down a bunch of the production control systems. So that was, that was pretty fun. Although, uh, <laughs> you know, it was only fun because it was competition. I don't know if I want to repeat the experience in the industry. <laughs> That's actually pretty cool. I, I actually didn't know that um, that Robinson worked on like GDPR because I'm like, he, I always talk to him and he's like, dude, I hate paperwork. I hate auditing. <laughs> and I'm like, now I understand yeah, why. Yeah, yeah. This it, is why he hates it. That's why he hates it. And I was like, yeah, dude, that's so good. Sorry, do you have a, do you have another question? I don't want to keep taking. I don't want to take the spot. Like no, from these are good questions. What do you mean? Good you questions. have good questions. I know. You and you're questions. graduating tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I tomorrow. Let me ask you a question, Jacob. Oh, what yeah. are your favorite CCDC slash CPTC moments? <laughs> that Taylor moment. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually great. Well, I have a question for you. I guess that's another good one. Um, it's. Like, what have been your experiences with some of the peeps that, like, um, that, like, more at the senior level? Like, what are, what are some of the things that you ended up, like, kind of, like, learning over? Not from us specifically, but I know you, like, interacted with, you're becoming, like, the new face of CIS. Oh, well, oh. <laughs> it might not be CIS <laughs> after this podcast. Hey, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, you've interacted with a lot of different peeps, but, like, what, what are some of the things that you, like, ended up, like, kind of, like, learning? I think the most important thing was probably like putting myself out there being able to make myself like sort of vulnerable in a sense and like just making sure I was comfortable with being uncomfortable because you're you're really never going to be comfortable and like realistically you kind of have to make sure that you can actually be uncomfortable and like just keep treading on is what I learned especially from like people like these guys um, all their all their stories which I have on this podcast um, is really inspirational. And I think it's really a testament to what Swift is. It really inspires and it has like a cascading effect on the new members as well. Um, the Swift children. <laughs> hopefully I don't mess it up. Um, I, there's more people watching. Yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but yeah, I, re I really like the cascading effect that Swift provides and the legacy that it, that it gives to people. I think my, uh, 
One of my favorite memories, I guess, in terms of like, because I didn't compete in CCDC or CPTC, but um, one of my favorite highlights was like, um, I got two opportunities this year to kind of like um, be kind of a coach and like a mentor for for two teams. You all, technically like five, but <laughs> yeah. So ITC, not related to this, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So for ITC, um, I ended up coaching your team, yes. which uh, ended up, um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's just funny to me because um, I, I interact with Jacob a lot and just kind of like, <laughs> you never get to see how people work from like one perspective, right? You know I mean? Like you interact with them, like you, you, I see your work ethic and all that kind of stuff, but to see you in like a group setting and like having to solve problems together was such an interesting thing. <laughs> Everything was on fire. Everything was on fire. Just the way that you guys like had to go through conflict resolution and all this different stuff that I had to go through the same exact thing for. It was so awesome to kind of like see that from the other perspective and to uh, helping you guys out like go through these different things and have to like, you know, and finally you guys and actually winning first place was like such a wild time for me. Cause like, I remember when you just like randomly messaged me and it's like, <laughs> can you can you help us with our thing? And I'm like, yeah, okay. that's <laughs> the, the, the report is doing two days. We have <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was only like two days. And then you know what I'm like, let's crank it out, baby. <laughs> So I'm like, just, dude, it, it was such a like um, heartwarming experience for me because like you guys actually were going through so many of the different things and like just the fact that you ended up going out and reaching out like to me was something that I ended up having to do like so many different times before and just seeing that like, um, you know, me being able to, to go ahead and like help you with the report writing and like any, answer any of the different questions like that's something that resonated with me a significant amount because that I wanted to be able to like be that example for like um, hopefully you can be that example for other peeps moving forward and stuff because I know like um, when I ended up first having to ask like uh, one particular person like for my ITC project um, they never answered back oh, <laughs> I got ghosted no. so many different times and yeah. like uh, <laughs> I, I was ghosted so many different times by so many different professionals and like in <laughs> from alumni and stuff that I was like you know what if this person is asking me for help, I'm gonna be there for that. I wanna make sure that like I can provide the best opportunity over for them and like the best experience for it because I don't want them to have the same like experience that I did. So um, for me, like that, that was one of like the championing moment, moments for me was like being able to coach over for your team. So that was like one other thing. Um, <laughs> the other one too was uh, NCAE. Like NCAE was a, uh, it was something. It was a bit something. <laughs> um, there were so many logistical difficulties that we en ended up having to go, but um, I was kind of like acting as coach for, for some of the for two different teams that we had like that were going to compete. So NCAE, if you don't know, um, I think the better way to put it is like it's marketed as uh, <laughs> entry level CCDC, if you want to think of it. CCDC for children. CCDC for children. So, you know, you kind of get that impression that it's going to be, yeah, it's, you know, it's a little easier. But, <laughs> dude, the challenges that they had to put on there were pretty crazy. So, anyways, though, that, that's something else. But I think for me, like, um, was the biggest thing that I ended up, like, in encountering and finding, like, such big, you know, aha proud dad moment was through the entire dumpster fire that it kind of was in terms of like organizing different things and like you know having to get people um you know to kind of get through stuff was honestly just the teamwork element that was there like being there from like day one up to like where we are now with some of the peeps like still returning back over and even like jimmy who i initially like i i, I genuinely so <laughs> well, let me go over to that. Just shout out to Jimmy because I, I love that kid. That, that kid is so good. But um, <sighs> I had to recollect because I'm like, I feel so bad. Um, so initially, right, we had to go through like the interview process um, it, to pretty much like kind of select the people that we were thinking we're, we're going to best represent the teams back over, you know, that we're going to be going into this competition. So Jimmy was one of the peeps that first initially applied over and uh, we interviewed him. And... <laughs> I feel so bad saying this, but I, he didn't do that great. <laughs> I'm like, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that in a bad way. But I'm like, he, he ended up coming over and, you know, I initially, we initially ended up rejecting him. <laughs> Um, just uh, like, <laughs> no, the, the reason I laugh is because he has made such a tremendous journey from like where he ended up starting and my first interaction with him to where he is now. 
because it is like he is such a champion in terms of like you know what I'm gonna take whatever it is feedback that's being given over to me and I'm gonna overcome that kind of, and I'm gonna go overcome that and take that over to heart and that, that's the reason I laugh is because like he made such a significant journey from like round zero over to like zero to hero kind of thing and that's like something that I admire a lot especially from a lot of the peeps that participated in NCAE Derek especially Felipe all a, a lot of these people who participated over like they the fact that they're still going over to meetings and that they're still interacting with each other was the biggest like aha moment for me where I'm like, you know what, this is what I want to do. Like I want to be able to give that experience back over to everyone who, who comes and interacts with the club. And so that's why I'm like, it, it's funny to me because like initially like rejecting him over, I feel so stupid about it because I'm like, dude, uh, like it, it, it takes time. Like, you know what? It, it takes time to be able to kind of see how people grow and all that kind of stuff. So you can never initially see that like the first run through, but that's like the thing, right? Is that you, as a person, you have to be able to take these things back over into account and grow from them. So Jimmy being like one of the busy, biggest examples for that, he literally like immediately, once I told him, once I gave him the rejection message, he's like, Hey, how come I didn't do that? Can you, I, I don't care like whether or not I made it on the thing. Can you just give me feedback? Uh, can you just let me know like, what can I do to better improve myself? And I sent them that stuff over and he's like, oh yeah. So like actually seeing, um, you know, if the guys were talking to me about like his interview process now and just the fact that he's like interacting with Derek and they're doing Hack the Box together and they're doing all these different things is like super awesome and eye-opening to me. So for me, that's like the biggest thing. I had two really big like aha moments for that. And that was like coaching your team and like interacting with so many the different peeps on the NCAE teams and not only that like I think Karina and Brian too like they ended up like starting over in NCAE and they even like went over to like start participating in other competitions like ITC and stuff so just the fact that like you can have these small little interactions with people and just have that blow over to like having them go win first place and all that <laughs> kind of stuff and make new different connections for themselves is like such a satisfying thing for me because like I generally don't care about winning the biggest thing for me is just like making sure that everyone else around me can win like we can win together so for for me that like that was one of the most uh, the biggest two highlights of uh of this year like not only being in the club but like competition wise everything it was like you know helping out with your team and then like helping out with the ncae teams and just in general like every single time i meet somebody new like <laughs> that's always a big champion moment for me so i'm like that, that's the stuff that i always go over yeah so i have no more questions but if you have anything yeah, what direction do you see Swift going in? Do you think this is like the golden age of Swift or like, where I, do you see Swift doing in the future? I don't want to say this is the golden age because I'm confident it's going to get better for sure, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> if this is the golden age, next year might be the platinum age, who knows? <laughs> but like, um, <laughs> the platinum age? I, I know that Swift in the past has had like a disconnect between the eboard members and the members. Like the only ones who really benefited were the eboard members because they were, you know, teaching workshops and stuff. But one thing that I really like about this year is that like people like Luis has made such great strides to get members involved in other competitions. And I think that's like something that is really beautiful because it shows like this club has opportunities for everyone and not just for like a select few. And that's really what we should be all about. So like we, we, I remember like Luis and I, we set up NCL teams, we set up high storm teams, and then Luis set up like two NCA teams of like 10 people each initially. That is crazy. And like, I want to like really push out this message. If you are watching this and you haven't participated in any of the competitions yet, don't worry, we got you. Like we'll, <laughs> we'll set up you with yeah. a team with we'll other folks and stuff. And you should really take advantage of this opportunity because one, not only are you going to learn a lot, two, you're going to make lifelong friends and like you know like Luis mentioned Derek uh Jimmy Bryant Karina really good friends now they do lots of stuff together and that could be you as well so like get out there not just because you want to improve your technical aspects but also because you want to be more social you know make some friends because those people that networking it's going to take you far on that note by the way for competitions we a lot of the people who competed, let's say, 10 years ago in CCDC together from Swift and from Cal Poly are still interacting with one another in a professional sense for, like, conferences, for work, and they still know one another. And, in fact, I, I want to specifically thank Jeff Best, who is an alumni 
And Jeff Best is truly the best. <laughs> yeah. Like, he got a bunch of alumni from his year, which I don't remember when it was, but he got all the people that he knew from Cal Poly who were in different competition teams and in Swift, and he got them to come together and help mentor our students the last year. And that just speaks to just how strong these connections are that we build through both Swift and the different competitions and projects that we do. You know, we might be together and working on things and hanging out together at Cal Poly, but then once we graduate, this is not going to be the last time that we're together with Luis and Lawrence, and we're probably going to see Jacob too as well. <laughs> yeah. So it's these connections that you build have the potential to be lifelong. And so take advantage of that while you can, while you have the opportunity to compete and do all these things like Swift, Red versus Blue even. Just do all these things and make sure that you build all these connections because you're going to need them after you graduate. Dude, I totally forgot, like, even that we that we made those teams and just, like, the fact for, for Red versus Blue. Like, dude, that's such a giant chapter. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's so many things that went into that. It's great. Um, but, yeah, I, I think in terms of, like, the sentiment I have for, like, y'all moving forward, it's... It's super cool because um, I made this reference back over into the totally not first take, but um, yeah, like Swift is like a band of misfits. Like there's so many people from so many different backgrounds and it's like super wild to kind of like see and hear all about all these different stories about like how you get into cyber, how you get into IT, how you get into like all these different things. And it, it feels like a band, like literally, <laughs> it feels like being in a band where everyone is so dedicated to go out of their way to like make sure that the, the vision is like clear, not only clear, but that it's like obtainable. And so that's something that I reflect on because I'm actually in a band. So it's like basically being Mortalis. married. Mortalis. Mortalis. But it's like, that, that's the same sentiment I have when I'm in Swift, like where I feel like I'm at home, where I feel like I'm like with hanging out with like cool peeps where we like know when it's like, you know, we, we can mess around with each other, but when it's time to like work on things, like we grind down, like we'll go the extra mile. Like, oh man, I still remember when Taylor, like the first semester when um, we were doing the uh, CTF for um, for the, it was like the penetration testing stuff where we had to set, set up that, that series of CTFs or whatever, where we were like, yeah. <laughs> Dude, Taylor didn't sleep the whole night just because he wanted to make it like, what was it work? Oh, no, it was like the Windows thing or something. But he literally stayed up from like <laughs> the entire oh, night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like obsessed with making this thing work. And he he went the full mile and stayed up all night and still went to work that next morning. And I was like, my man is a hero. But, I, but it was like, it, it's small things that like that that end up like kind of pushing and setting the example kind of for like everyone else. And I think that was like one of the, that was for me like the definitive moment where I'm like, you know what? This is what I want to be like a part of. Like this is the part of the mission. This is the part of like the vision that I want to see like come into fruition. And I think that same general sentiment is something that like, um, that I see already with like the new peeps coming in like yourself and like the new group of Swift children, like <laughs> we're going to be taking over after us where it's like, we see that dedication kind of coming over. So we're leaving it in I'm, like, there's no doubt in my mind, like where we first started with this podcast where it's like, you know what? we're leaving it in like really great hands over here. Like there's no uh, doubt no, in my mind that the, <laughs> and my hands are breaking right now. So but the podcast was started by a freshman. Yeah. Like this is all you need to know about what's coming for Swift. The OSCP was taken on <laughs> by a freshman. So it's like, dude, there's so, there's so many different um, great talents that are coming into like the club that no doubt in my mind that like things moving forward, like it, it only really goes up. And even then it's like, that's the cool part. Like, that's the whole point of what we were, like, here to do, like, with our time in the club was, like, to increase all this kind of stuff. So, at the end of the day, yeah, it's a bittersweet moment, but it's still satisfactory. In the same way that Alex, like, mentioned in the beginning where it's, like, we're leaving this off on, like, a really good note. And that's, like, the most important thing is that that's what you always want to do as a club, right? You always want to leave things back over at a high note better than what you – better than when you came into it, right? And I think that's something that, like, within – as, like, I'm reflecting – um, well, as we graduate tomorrow, but it's like, that's what, that's, that's like the biggest thing for me is that like, we're leaving this off, um, at a really good note. We're leaving this off better than when we came in. You know, on, on that same topic, because as much as Swift has been going on, like the cycle for many years, um, there has been ups and downs and like for everyone, literally everyone, COVID was a big down for Swift because 
club attendance just goes down massively when it's online engagement in both classes and clubs just dies off like people are, are much less likely to actually participate and speak and and take advantage and take initiative really uh, of the different opportunities that are presented to them because it's just remote right and we don't really get these same relationships and connections because we don't really have that in-person element however what we have managed to accomplish is take this club that is on the decline, but that's not necessarily a decline that's specific to Swift. It's just everything at Cal Poly was <laughs> at a decline yeah. due to COVID. And we managed to take it up at that low point, and then we managed to build it up from one of the smallest eboards ever at the time and to basically one of the biggest and the most active. Because we took it from where the VP of Ops was basically doing most of the different workshops and presentations, that was Taylor, by the way, to where we have a big enough team where the VP of Ops, which was me, I was just doing visionary work as in, oh, you know, I was doing a jog and I thought that this event would be kind of cool to have. <laughs> and then I come up to my team and then I'm the reason why they don't sleep for the week <laughs> because they're busy working on it. Um, but we just managed to take it from that low point to build it up to a very high point to where, you know, most of the other organizations on campus really haven't kept up with us. Um, and when things really came back to in person, there's now all these opportunities that are open to be taken advantage of, like the SDC, like the SOC, like the different research projects and a lot of different other things. But Swift is really the only org that's on the upturn because everyone else was just really struggling through COVID. But we managed to build up to the point where now that these opportunities are open, Swift is just taking advantage of all of them because we're the most numerous and the most technical club. And so that's what I'm really proud of that we've contributed to because we were able to take Swift and our school really through some of the hardest times that it has ever experienced and unprecedented times really to a point where they're about to have unprecedented success because they're their only org that really survived and thrived through that. Yeah. I think one of the other like uh, definitive moments just kind of like going on that end too is just like when we were doing our, our big four meeting with um, all, all the other different clubs and stuff and just seeing the massive participation over for like an interest like I think we peaked at like 85 people when we were doing um, when we were showing off the competition when we were showing off our club and stuff and so you know I think it goes down to that same amount of sentiment because we when we work like that's the coolest thing is that like we buckle down and we want to make sure that like every single thing is like down to a T. And not only that, but like that, it's accessible to as many people as possible. Like one of the coolest things too was just like the fact that when we were switching over from um, last semester over to like our hybrid model that we have now where we have like, you know, <laughs> where we have something like this where it's like, you know, we have the visuals and we have all that kind of stuff. But aside from that too, right, is like we started to transition our workshops to work like in the classroom, but also like if you're still stuck at home, like we still wanted to present that opportunity back over. And so like that was one of the coolest things as is that we were like down with that. We were all on board with wanting to make sure that people could still get that interaction regardless of where they were. And I like that's just a, a testament to like I think how we operate is that we always wanted to make sure that like at the end of the at the end of the day or regardless of whether it is that we were doing like you know um i call it the unspoken mission but whether or not we were doing like oh you know the super high technical thing or whatever we were still making sure that it was accessible by somebody that somebody was going to be able to learn from this at the end of the day and that you know they could still go back over like <laughs> 30 years later and still watch the video kind of thing and so i think like that was such a big testament over to like what it is that we were doing that um it regardless it was always bringing opportunities back over to as many people as possible unspoken but i think that's like that, that that's one of the coolest things like being a part of the club and seeing that from the back turn because i'm like i can only imagine <laughs> like there's so many different things that go behind the scenes to make things work but they work but like that's that's uh that, that's the funny part is that like we we spent so much time in like trying to make things like 
you know, work and stuff, and like finally being able to see it come to fruition is fantastic. Like, <laughs> like RVP. RVP. <laughs> oh yeah, that is a lot of duct tape going into that. Yeah, all the stuff that you don't see about RVP is just. It's hard to describe. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, man. I'm like, he could probably talk about it for hours. But Just it's... Jacob doesn't sleep is basically <laughs> the idea. A lot of our team doesn't sleep. Yeah, a lot of our team doesn't sleep, in fact. There you go. Well, that, that was the other cool thing, too, is like RVB was such a fun experience as well. It's like, dang. Like, we, we're bringing this competition environment over to peeps so that they can learn. That was such a fun thing, too. Because I'm like, that's where I learned a lot, too, in terms of like the technical expertise and stuff. And that's where like a lot of the things from CPTC and CCDC trainings from like, forever ago ended up coming back over so i was like that was real fun it was a good time but yeah i think that's like that's such a it, it's such a great feeling to be around like this environment and stuff so hopefully that's something that continues moving forward and whatnot you can yeah. read more about rvb on the website yeah sign up for it i might make an rvb podcast episode it's just gabe know. yelling it's just us <laughs> yeah it was 4 a.m <laughs> <laughs> it's so good man yeah it's so funny yeah. Got what? You have any more huh? questions? You have more questions? Huh? You have more questions? What are your plans with the, uh, with just Swift in general after we're all gone, Jacob? I'm planning on more podcasts with like the certain teams within Swift. Maybe do some collabs with like Mr. and Fast if they respond to me. But oh, that'd be really cool, like a cross collaboration podcast. Yeah, and right? I, I think it'd give a lot of insight into them as well because I know a lot of general members come into Swift like not really knowing the eboard members and hopefully they can put this in the background when they're cheating on their homework. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, I mean, that's something we didn't talk about either. I'm am like, I, uh, what, cheating on the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we wouldn't talk about that. You know? uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like what are your plans afterwards? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm like, we, we have our whole legacy going, but like where, where are you going? Yeah, we're like, what's the plan after this? Colorado. Colorado, baby. See ya. Later. Yeah. See ya, losers. <laughs> yeah, that's my plan, basically. I uh, kind of alluded to uh, already having an offer. I got a really good offer with Mandiant, who is now being bought out by Google. Oh. Fingers crossed that they also uh, boost the salaries up to Google. Level. <laughs> and I'll be moving to uh, Denver, Colorado to do red teaming, red team consulting full time. So I'll, if you're not familiar with red teaming, what that basically is, a company hires you to be just an APT, uh, a legal APT. You just, <laughs> you break in, you fish people, you try to get as much access as you can, you try to reach the objectives that they pose you, and then you provide a report of what you did and how they can go about fixing all these different things that you found. And I think that's a very unique and fun career choice because, uh, you know, rarely ever does somebody ever have the privilege of just doing crime and getting paid for it legally. <laughs> so I, I think that, yeah, you, you need to have a little malice within your heart to do red teaming, but I think it's super fun. What about you, Lawrence? I'm going to be going over to Marietta, Georgia to work for Lockheed Martin, which is an aerospace company. And they do like uh, contract work for the U.S. government. So I had to like get my whole security clearance and everything, which was, thank goodness I passed. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Why'd you look at me like that? <laughs> my record is very clean. But um, yeah, I'm going to be doing platform security. And if you want to know what that is, I can't tell you. <laughs> it, it, it's, like, it's, it's like contract work for the government. So you get really little information about the job. So all I know is that I'm going to be working with... Um, Ansible and sent OS, which is really ironic considering I was part of the Windows team. <laughs> <laughs> but here's to a good future. It's actually pretty cool. Um, oh, for myself, uh, I'll be going over and working for Calamp, basically doing sysadmin work. So jack of all trades, uh, pretty much anything from, hey, these cables need work, to can you just like uh, make our entire network work? <laughs> so it, it's a it's a lot of different things, but that's kind of like the main gist of what I'm working for. They're like a, they're what is it? Man, I keep forgetting even the name of it, but it's like IoT devices. So they tend to play around with a lot of these different things. So getting my hands dirty with all that different technology. So another cool thing too is that it's like um, like in terms of cyber, uh, we, we didn't get to talk about this earlier, but. Um, like you can always come back into cyber. You can literally be like 45, 60. There's a dude who in my class who's like 
like pushing 55 and he's like getting into cyber and he already has an internship too should talk to him Let's go. maybe he wouldn't want to be in here but yeah i think like that's a cool thing about like I it and stuff is that like never too late to come back into it like all these different pieces of knowledge like well you might have to update like in terms of the context on how it works but they're always ingrained into you like you'll always remember like where these kind of things are and like the directories and all that kind of stuff like the fundamental knowledge in terms of like how do i google thing how do i search for question like that's always going to be there forever so i think that's like that's the cool thing about like why i admire cybersecurity a lot is that like you can always come jump into it like regardless if you take a five month break to like maybe a couple year break but it's always doable but yeah that's where i'm headed you have like summer plans too right Chico? yes more podcasts <laughs> 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 and maybe um we have a lot of things planned for like outreach or so with yeah you know, like SoCal? day in the life what, what about SoCal? Yeah, what about SoCal? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll be starting at SoCal Edison as a intern, cybersecurity intern over there. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, hopefully, you'll get to see some of it over the summer. But, yeah, it'll be pretty interesting. Yeah, I, it's true. basically Taylor's old job, <laughs> and he just gave it to me. I'm seeing Taylor for, like, one day, and he's going. He's leaving to Caltrick. Oh, my gosh. Following your father's footsteps. Yes. <laughs> I'm literally seeing him for one day. So like, bye. <laughs> Crowd check next. Hey, hey, oh, about that one. What do you mean? We'll what see. do you mean? We'll see. We'll see. What do you mean about that, dude? You're crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Yep. I'll see you on the next episode. Hopefully. If there is a <laughs> Thank you for coming to episode two of the Jacob Heine Show. Oh. <laughs> oh.